Welcome to The Brain Dump, where we study the psychology of success. Join us as we probe the habits, rituals, and routines of top-performing artists, entrepreneurs, authors, athletes, and more to uncover the timeless principles we can all use to take our lives to the next level. Are you ready to plunge the grunge that's been gunking up your mind's eye? Great, then let's get to it. Guys, welcome to the Brain Dump, Brain Dump, Brain Dump. Look, we got Anthony in the house. How you doing, my man? Did you just do a little sound effect? Yes. <laughs> like a little mouth sound effect? <laughs> yeah. Man, I did not know you were like moonlighting as, uh, what is it? Who is that guy from uh, it's, East Academy? Like Yes, but more impressive is Bruce Buffer, the guy that does the announcing for the fights and stuff. Like his story is amazing. Dude, so let's talk about Bruce, but then let's talk about Bruce's brother, lesser known brother, who's yes. also a ring announcer. Yes. How, how, first of all, ring announcing runs in the family. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> but that's all very tangential, <laughs> but I think we're off to a strong start. Dude, I, I got a podcast. Dude, you know who we have? Anthony, this is- I actually this, have no clue. This man, this man is about, he's about 10 layers of complexity. That's that would be an understatement. Uh, good friend of mine. We've got Leland Redfield in the house. How you doing, Marilla? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, guys. I'm excited to be here. You got it. So he doesn't want to talk about himself, guys. So we'll we'll, we'll just call him the ninja entrepreneur and uh, the mayor of Montana, or the, excuse yeah, me, the governor yeah. of Montana. So, uh, <laughs> but that's but, that's where the cult's gonna. But but what's interesting, guys, is we actually don't know the topic that we're going to talk about today. So. Leland's going to share it with us. So what are we going to talk about today? So today we're going to talk about aha moments. So <sighs> moments that we've had in our past that have, that are just those, you know, I see the light moments. Um, mm. So before this, we were doing our coaching call and we were doing kind of a huddle with our coaches. And that was one of the things we asked them to say is like, Hey, we're, you know, we do internet marketing. What were the, your aha moments when you joined this? But you know, given what you guys talk about and what you, uh, I, I guess I don't know all of your experience, but Austin, you know, there's aha moments in all sorts of areas of our life. So I'd like to keep it broad. And uh, so that's the topic. Man, I am, this is, did you see that one coming, Anthony? No, how could I? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, like, we no, have yeah. the infinite expanse of topics to choose from. I didn't have a clue, but I love it because it doesn't mean I have to reveal anything like too emotionally gushy today. So that's going to be nice and easy for me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know what? Austin's always, always over here making me feel things. You know what? You know what? I'll share my first one. And I, and I remember where I was, well, not my first one. I'll share one that, that really set with me. I was very angry for a long time, you know, in my alcoholism and in my parents' divorce, I played a victim for 20 years. And when I started doing work, and I started realizing there was two big moments in that scenario is I realized somebody asked me very direct and very aggressively, a guy that I respect who had a crazy life. He said, I hear you talk about all this shit about your parents' divorce and all these years, the things that happened to you. He goes, when are you going to take credit? When are you going to take ownership of any part that you played in it? There's something that happened. And then there's the stories that you told yourself for 20 years. Are you living your stories or are you living the moment? And that was the holy shit moment to me. That's when I called my dad and said, like, I apologize. And like, we kind of started mending. And then it was like a week later where I realized that it wasn't the promises that other people were breaking to me. It was the promises that I broke with myself that was destroying who I was as a person. And that was like the holy fuck moment for me because you spend your whole life projecting outwards instead of looking at the man in the mirror. Yeah. Well, so I, I mean, I could, there's two things I would like to say. Jack Canfield has a line. Uh, you guys know Jack Canfield, the ch chicken soup for the soul guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes, everybody's got a story and he goes, but that's your, so what? And, and that's sort of the, the back point to yours is that like, everybody's gone through hard shit, right? If you're going to go do stuff like talking about your, so what to people is it's just another, so what, right? It's, you know, if that's the thing that you're filling your time and your space with, right. 
Um, it's your so what. But the other thing that you said about it's not the, the promises that other people were breaking. One of the things John Martini talks about is that, you know, the thing that'll make you miserable is when you expect other people to live from your highest values or from your values, right? You know, I value time doing this and they don't want to do this with me. Therefore, they don't love me. It's like, no, they're trying to live their own life. They don't like fishing. I know you like fishing and I know you want to spend time with your dad, but if your dad doesn't like fishing, you know, so one of the things that I learned from John Martini was, you know, loving people for their hierarchy of values, the things that they want to spend time doing and not having expectations for them to be doing the things that I love doing because, because I don't, because you don't want to, you don't want to set a standard where you're doing things that you're, that you, you don't love doing to make other people happy. Cause it's just, you'll never, it's a void that'll never, you'll never fill it. Right. Cause you're always going to be subject to what they want and you're always going to feel guilty because you could always give more. So another aha moment for me, when John D. Martini talks about your hierarchy of values, it's like, everyone's got these, these values, things that they love, you know, from most to least and loving them for that versus trying to get them to change it um, is a big way that helps it it helps dissolve conflict right whenever you're butting heads with people usually it's just there's a there's a hierarchy of values you don't understand that they're seeking their values you're seeking your values and understanding that that's how people see their their frame right is has been real powerful for me for for one of my aha moments john demartini uh his hierarchy of values this this reminds me a lot of um I can't remember who was who who's responsible for this, but it's the idea that at, at its core, men value what is it, respect, and women value love. And I think that's like a pretty simplistic, really distilled, watered down version of like what's actually occurring there. But it's a helpful framework for understanding that the person across from you they have a different set of lists of like wants, needs, desires, likes. And as you're pointing out, values, like a hierarchy that they operate in the world. And when you try to force other people into your framework, it doesn't work because your framework is built for you. It's been custom measured. It's like a suit that's been designed just for you. And now you're forcing somebody else to wear it and it doesn't look very good on them. And so acknowledging that the way that other people see the world and meeting them where they are is, I think, the key to probably um, like the key to unlocking the majority of conflicts that you're likely to have, whether it's in business and relationships. Hmm. Framework. I like the word framework a lot. There's a good book about frame. And one of the things they say that, that the bottom of the bottom of every hierarchy can't control frame, can't control their own frame. Mm -hmm. Right. Which really means that whatever they're kind of subject to whatever frame people are throwing at them. Right. Which goes back, you know, you're a victim or your insert, whatever uh, the headlines are that day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but, but you know, controlling your own frame is a powerful thing, especially once you, you know, have tough times, right? Who are you? You know, are you the guy who, you know, gets his ass kicked and stays down? Or, you know, who are you? Like, that's your frame control. Frame control is the term that they use. I really like that. I like to think of myself as kind of like a reverse Rocky Balboa. I get hit and I stay down. So <laughs> no, awesome. That was a, that was a, that was a great share. Leland, I'm curious for you. What's uh what's been a big aha moment in your life? Uh, so I've had one of the ones that came to mind, right. When you said that was, you know, I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan and everybody's, you know, that's in these circles, but when you go to UPW and you really understand the powerful persuasion and you understand a lot of people go to his events and then they leave and they want to be Tony Robbins. They want to be on stage. They want to be the guy because they feel really good. They feel inspired. And so it's taken me a really long, it's taken me more time to unwind and be willing to just walk my own path. Um, and and live in the Tony Robbins groups, but not needing to be like, like I don't have a brand. I don't do social media, right? I'm kind of the opposite of of what most people who do the internet stuff are. Like I I have an Instagram, but I don't. So a big aha moment for me was, you know, if you're in the coaching and the consulting thing, it's like, who do you need to be? Who's the stereotypical coach, consultant, performance person, and not needing to be that guy, right? It's 
you know, I don't need to be that guy. I don't need to be the, the guy on stage. Like I don't need to be dressed in a nice suit. Um, you know, that you can help people and not have a social media presence. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, what a shocking idea. Um, but yeah, recently, I mean, when you, when you said that, that was a big one for me. Cause we, you know, we were, I don't want to say drinking the Kool-Aid cause I'm thankful for all the coaches and the mentors and the books and all that stuff. But a lot of times you can get caught up with, you know, inje- I would say injected values, wanting to be those people, right? And and when you hear those success stories, especially I know Austin does a lot of real estate, mm-hmm. or you see the coaches, it's like you hear these success stories, and that can really beat you up if you uh, if you let it, or if you, yeah, if you don't really know who you want to be. So a big aha moment for me was kind of transitioning from. Oh, I definitely love coaching, but I'm I'm gonna find my own path. I'm gonna help people my own way. Um, I don't need to be, you know, the stereotypical like coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, man, that one's a powerful one because it it ties into the idea. There's all the world already has a Tony Robbins, right? Like it's already that, but we don't have a Leland. We don't have a a Leland Redfield, and so you you are the only one who can fill that role. And the problem is I love the way you put that injected values. The way we talk about this is, or the way I talk about it rather is that, are you dreaming your own dream or are you accidentally dreaming somebody else's dream, whether that's the American dream or it's the Tony Robbins dream, or it's like, if you want to be, you know, an influencer dream, like whatever that dream is, have you really stopped to evaluate why you want to dream that? Was it implanted or injected as you put it, or is it actually springing out of like the unique, place that is you. And I think a lot of us, I'm just as guilty of this as anybody, probably more guilty is latching on to other people's dreams and maybe even like cobbling them together into some kind of weird Frankenstein where now I'm like trying to live all these values and never really stepping back and saying, okay, well at the core, what is my dream? Who, and how can I manifest that in a way that only I can do? I'd love no. to hear what, what you guys think about the idea of discovering yourself versus creating yourself along those lines, right? Because, you know, are we, because you're trying to live your own dream. And this is something, you know, I think about a lot. I want to live my own dream. Do I discover my own dream or am I creating it, right? Because there's a nuance there that, that um, you know, it's like, are you shedding? Because because I inject other people's dreams. Oh, that looks fun. I want to go do that. But the, yeah. that looks fun is also important because you're drawn to it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so then you go do it and you find out if you actually like doing it or not. But how do you guys think about, you know, discovering yourself versus creating yourself, if that makes sense? So I was on a plane recently back in February, flying out to an event where we were it's a small, small group where we were talking about influence and persuasion and public speaking. And I happened to be on the flight with the guy that was going to be leading the group. And I went up and we sat next to each other and had a good conversation. It was our first time meeting. And he asked me, so like, what are you hoping to get out of this thing? And I was like, you know, I'm not really sure. I think part of it is I'm trying to figure out which version of myself I want to put out into the world. And he goes, I think maybe the, that's the wrong question to be asking. Isn't like who you want to be known as, as much as trying to figure out who you currently are. And that gets into the idea of, are you discovering what's already in there or are you creating it? And I think for me, it's a little bit of both. And I think there is a simultaneous discovery and creation process occurring and it's, it's magical. I think the difficulty that I've run into is trying to lean too heavily on just the pure creation side and not giving enough, I would say, credence or attention to the discovering what's already there, if that makes sense. Because the discovery portion, that requires you to to dig inward and get through all the muck of like who you are and say, okay, that's what's in there. Now, how do we build off of that? I look at it from a context of like uh, a coaching scenario. Like my clients are like, Oh, like it's great, man. Like you're, you're some sort of like mystic and you can like, you know, like you're, you're, you're changing me. And I'm like, no, I'm just cleaning off the dirty windshield of everything that was already inside of you that you just don't know. And, and so I think the same about me, 
like everybody says like Austin's made this huge transformation. Like he's sober and he's lost weight and he's, you know, business. And I'm like, well, really, like I was born with all those things. I just choose not to see them in myself for 20 plus years. And so I think that who you're becoming in the process with good books and great mentors and surrounded by like-minded people can definitely elevate and, and you can grow into that. But I think ultimately your gifts are, are probably inside of you from the beginning and you can polish those off and make them better and you can be drawn towards more things. You know, I had a guy today I interviewed, he said, I see you. I don't know why he said this because I'd never even thought about it. He says, I see you as a movie director in your older age. And I was like, what? But like, then I thought to myself, like, I really want to write music and I love photography. And like, so like, I can see that, but like at this point in my life, those qualities aren't what's serving me. And I think you have a very successful business, Leland, and who you are right now in your day-to-day life may be look entirely different 10 years from now when you've made some investments. And I mean, wouldn't you agree with me that like the things that you have to do today to keep a sustainable business for, for you and your wife and your family aren't going to be the things that you do 10 years from now, or they are going to be the things that you continue to do. Oh, we're, we're trying to do, we're building, our, building ourselves out of the business, right? I okay. mean, you know some of that stuff because we're, yeah. we're, we have the right amount of panic that I think you need <laughs> when you have a successful business. <laughs> that, that, that should yeah. go on a shirt. We've got the, we got the right, right amount of panic. I, I, dude, dude, you just blew my mind out of my body with that. We got the right amount of panic in a business. Well, I think, you know, I, I, when you we're lucky and because, you know, we realize that the way that things might not be this way. We're, you know, we're investing in real estate. We're investing, we're, we're diversifying very rapidly. We're trying to replace, you know, I mean, we've got, we, we've got our numbers all mapped out. We're trying to replace all of the revenue that we, that we need uh, from other sources. And, but we're also doubling down and tripling down uh, with the things that are working. So, but yeah, we're, there's a, there's a, a level of panic. I think it's healthy though, for like entrepreneurs, especially if you are doing well, it's like, Man, if you lose that, if you get comfortable, um, you know, it. <laughs> it's, there's lots of competition out there, right? Uh, so, um, but yes, we have the right amount of panic. Um, it's hard to grow when you're comfortable, when you're comfortable, right? And it's, it's, it's easy to be overtaken depending on where you're trying to go. Um, because at, at the end of the day, we were just talking about this on the previous episode, is that there has to be a threshold of discomfort that gets tripped. And if you're not feeling that discomfort, if you're not feeling that need to keep pushing, then our default state is one of just, you know, resting on the laurels. And that's not going to help you get to where you're trying to go unless you have already arrived, in which case, good job. Just go ahead and sit down and like enjoy the rest of your life, I guess. But I think humans in general do not do well when we stop growing and stop pushing and start stop changing. Yeah, well, so one of my aha moments, we, we saw John Martini live and we spoke to him before, who's one of the, he's just an author that I like. And um, he said, outsource everything that's not in your top three highest values. And so he, again, he describes values in a little bit more detail than other people might. But, but you know, what are your top three highest values and then outsourcing everything else that's, that's not in there. And so, you know, for me, and Austin knows this, like I'm a, I, I'm a crazy learner, like one of those OCD watching business videos. <laughs> like I wake up, I wake up early. You guys are the same way. I'm sure I'm not yeah. saying that I'm, you know, special at all, but, but I know that <clears throat> learning is in my top three highest values. If I don't do it, I will go crazy. Right. And so, and if you look at my time, my bank account, this is how you would figure out your highest values. What do you spend your time doing? What do you spend your bank account on? What do you spend your energy on? What do you think about? There's a whole question of them. Um, I spend a lot of money on education, business type stuff, but I know that that's in line with my highest values, right? I know families are in line with my highest values. So our whole days are shifted around. We have two young boys. We've got some really quality family time. Um, And, you know, and then so outsourcing everything else that you can is just really powerful because it frees you up to do the things that you are most passionate about, you know, so grocery shopping, especially now you can get, you know, groceries delivered to your door. Um, 
you know, if you can afford a house been a game changer for us, man, it's been a game changer. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we had one of our friends recommended uh, that we get a house manager. We never would have thought about it. And it's been, it's been incredible. So now, you know, we, she helps us get the house set and my wife and I have a lot more, you know, free time to, to not, you know, sit in and not sit in a mess, but when you have two and a four year old, right, it's not too long until the house needs to be cleaned very well. So, mm -hmm. um, but so giving myself permission to kind of out, so what are okay. my three highest values and then getting rid of everything that's not on that list and knowing my wife's three highest values and, and knowing that they're not the same because mm -hmm. if we're in love and then our jobs are to make each other grow. So those friction points are, if, if two people's values are the same, one of them's not necessary. So, you know, she values her value set is different. We both know the top three and everything else. We're like, I don't ask her to do things that are level 10 because she'll look at me at like, no, like we can like understanding that is really powerful. Um, and I think a lot of people, we work with some yoga businesses. So a lot of people that we work with don't give themselves permission to outsource or to do jobs that they might think that they can just do themselves. So one of my big aha moments was, you know, that, that first outsource, uh, was just a big one for me, local outsource. I, I would say online outsourcing we've been doing for a while, but that's, you know, can often cause as many headaches. Um, but local outsourcing, like getting laundry services, groceries, you know, pre-cooked food, yada, yada, as much as you can, uh, was a epiphany, uh, for us. Mm-hmm. Austin, I'm really curious to put this question to you. Leland kind of alluded to his, one of his top three highest values. What is your top values? Do you have them kind of sussed out? Yeah. Impact. Um, impact. impact is probably number one for me. Uh, just knowing that, and I, and I say this with full confidence, knowing that I was strong enough to walk through all the up and downs that I've been through because I was deemed worthy to be able to turn around and then lift others up with my stories and my journey. And some didn't get out, right? Some didn't get out of their addiction. Some lost their lives. And so I, I almost look at it as a, as a burden that I'm happy to wear. Um, I love to talk. I love to communicate your stories and I love to learn. I really do love to learn if I'm excited about it. If I'm not, it doesn't even exist in my world. Mm. Um, and then I love to be, I love like my highest and thing is just to, you know, really it's just to like, I got big goals to give back. And I realize in order to do those, you're going to have to create massive wealth. And you can't do it from a place of things. So those are the things that I strive towards. I love it. So for people at home that are listening to this and they're thinking about their values, maybe it's the first time you've ever thought about this, something I would recommend if you don't know where to start, because there's so many different values that you could lob, glob onto, and it's not always clear which one's the right one. What you might do is go check out the Clifton Strength Finder test. It's like hundreds some on questions and it's going to rank you in all these different categories of what you're strong at, what you're weak at. And that's not going to tell you what you value per se, but it might tell you what you're pre-inclined to be good at. Like in the things that we tend to be good at are the things that we enjoy doing. And that's why we got good at it is because we spent so much time doing it. And so for me, three of the, it was really interesting. I took this test not too long back and the strengths that they that it turned back for me were almost identical to what I had already previously established as like my values. And so one of those was growth, like just constantly pushing to just be a little bit better. Like that's a really important aspect for me. Learning is my number one of everything is just constantly learning. And that goes hand in hand with growth and then creativity. Like I have to be creating. And if I'm not expressing that side of me, then I feel uh, like I'm not contributing to this universe in the way that I was put here to do. Nice. And, and so that's awesome. So creativity for me, not on my list at all, at least not in terms of, uh, cause like you can even tell it, you can even tell based off all of our, uh, screenshots. Yep. Right. Look how much more, right. You can, you can read into people's values right away if you know what to look for, 
but also it's, it's awesome knowing, Hey, if, if we were to ever do something, you know, creativity is going to be your thing. I'm not really going to add my two cents because Hey, I don't value it. You know? So it's not, I'm not going to be the one who's the most qualified, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. obviously, but understanding who you're working with is a lot more powerful. If you just know, man, I love this. I love creativity. I love the, uh, but that's not me, right? Well, Th- that's you. Well, but you are rocking the Ninja Turtles in the background. Yeah, but, there, so. but, but, but no, but did, are those Ninja Turtles. Bro- that's my brother's. Yes. Okay. Great, yes. great eye. <laughs> so he moved and he gave them to me. We just set up our oh, office. Buddy. And so I put him up there. I text him and I was like, Hey man, like, but no, I, I wouldn't, but thank you. And but, yeah, he, he, but, he's a creative one. He's got a sleeve of Ninja Turtles tattoos. Oh, that's cool. Right? So that's <laughs> but, uh, awesome. but didn't, but didn't we just use it in a previous context that George Bernard Shaw, uh, quote i'm gonna use it three times today <laughs> like, you. the 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 uh say it because i don't what was it uh this is something like the problem with communication is that we believe communication has occurred <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth in relationships and in business the problem that happens in business partnerships marriages relationships is that we believe that we're properly communicating who we are as a person and ultimately who you may be showing up is, is based off of stories and triggered emotions and not who you truly are. And so if you don't do the work, if you don't do what's necessary, then you're going to continually communicate improperly who you actually are, and you're going to be affected by it over and over again. And as you get older in life, the lessons get hurt more and cost more money. And so you can either wake up to the fact that there's a pattern in your life, or you can continue to blame everybody else for your problems. Mm-hmm. And so, but what I want to do is we shared ours and I bet you a hundred bucks. I can guess what Anthony's going to share, but I'll keep it to myself. Anthony, what's your aha? No, moment? there's, there's zero chance that you're going to get this one because <laughs> as I was thinking about it, I wrote out on my thing here, I wrote out a couple different ones and I was like, okay, I want to share something that I've never shared before on this okay. podcast. So I'm intentionally going, <laughs> going to take a left turn here. What, which, what were you? What were you were going to do your damn chess story. You share nope. it every time. It's, <laughs> it's written here, but I wasn't. I was like, I've done that one a million times. No, the the story I want to share is the first book that I ever published was a science fiction novel called Time Heist, and for I would say up to that point in my life, I was a very insular, focused individual. Still am very much think about myself constantly, but I. I always had this thought that people cared more or were thinking more about what I was doing or how I was doing it than reality has that uh, ultimately proven out. And this came to light because after I published that first book, it did really well within its niche. But I would go and I would talk to friends and family and everybody would be like, oh, it's all your new books, all your new book. And I was like, yeah, did you read it? Oh, yeah, no, it's next on the list. It's next on the list. I had people, I shit you not, I have siblings and my best friend to this day who will say, oh yeah, I've been meaning to read that. I'm like, that came out almost a decade ago. I've been doing this shit for a long time. If you're not going to read it, that's okay. And and at the end of the day, guys, it truly is. I don't care. Like if the book isn't written for you, it's written for me. And you know, if it connects with somebody, that's awesome. But what I learned from this is that, you know, I was sharing this story earlier this week, is that we are all just a universe of one and that we the entirety of your human experience is occurring inside your brain. And you spend 99% of that time on this planet thinking about yourself. And people are spending a whole lot less time thinking about what you're doing, how you're doing it. They're a whole lot less concerned with you than you think they are. And that was a really powerful thing for me because once I realized that, then it kind of freed me from a lot of the baggage of having to perform with the idea that I was meeting somebody else's expectation or that other people were going to judge me or care. Because at the end of the day, the book could have completely flopped and nobody would have noticed (laughs) Is what I learned from that. I was like, oh man, the thing that I've been worried about, worst case scenario, like it wouldn't have been a big deal regardless. And so that was my big aha moment is that we're a universe of one and nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. Well, even to that, everyone's just going to live their highest values. And so it's kind of what Austin was saying earlier about setting up false expectations, right? Mm-hmm. If you have expectations that other, everyone should read your book and the, and you read it and you didn't write it for them anyway, or maybe, I mean, their family, right? But maybe you wrote like a kid's book and it's... <laughs> You didn't, you know, it's not a book that's written for them. And even if it was, who gives a shit? Like, you know, 
they're going to go read whatever they want to read and love them for doing their own thing. You know, not, I'm not accusing you of this, but this is like the habit mm -hmm. that most people have is that, is that they have false expectations and that's the thing that cause, causes all their suffering. Right. Yeah. Well, what was really interesting from that experience wasn't even uh, my own expectation that my you know friends and family would read it. I guess in the back of my head, I was like, they probably will. I would like if my if my friend came out with a book, I'd read it. But that's me. I'm a reader. That's that's not a big ask. But their expectation was that they thought I expected them to read it. And so they would like apologize like, oh, it's next on the thing. And I was always like, well, it's okay if you don't like truly like, no, <laughs> it's not for you. It's a very niche thing over here. But to, to that, I would say the people that are listening to this, because I think you probably, if you're a human, you spend a lot of time thinking about what other humans think about you. And, and that might be causing you some baggage or causing you to get yourself off from showing up and, and doing whatever that thing is that you really want to do, uh, I would say, just ignore that, get over it. You're the gatekeeper and the, the fence door is wide open. So you can step out and just go do whatever it is. And nobody's going to care. Agreed. I love it. Now, hold on. Cause I want to unpack something and this is going to be an amazing conversation. Cause I've been wanting to talk about this forever and get into your brain about this. So, you know, everybody like in my Facebook group, they like write like their word, they write their word for the year. Like everybody's like attack, expand, like Got crush it. it, fire, you know, like so all aggressive. That shit. Yeah. Like aggressive shit. Like I'm going to go fucking destroy this year Conquer. And, and, and fucking Leland writes do less. <laughs> and I, oh, and it was, it was, it was so Yoda. It was so Yoda, but I want to hear context behind, dude, y'all have a very business that is very profitable and you have, a lot of responsibilities within that business, even though you outsource some, you're still running, you know, her company with your wife. So how, cause, cause he has a friend, Logan Freeman, who is using the word compression and he's trying to buy, how much is he trying to buy Anthony this year? A uh, hundred million, a hundred million with working less. Like he's trying to prove to everybody, you don't need to work harder to, to buy more real estate. And so I want to hear the context behind like how you frame that out because entrepreneurship at its core, people think that you need to try, push, 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 push. And you have to work 19 hour days. And you're telling me that your goal is to do less this year. <laughs> for, yeah, for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not working out for me. I mean, that's why I think it was, <laughs> it was a good goal. Well, I th I, it was more so as, as, um, as I evolve or as we all evolve, you want to kind of hack away the things that are not, are not working. Right. And so really what I want to be doing is more of the things that I love doing and then less of the stuff that, uh, you know, less of the stuff that isn't as fun. So, you know, when I build a lot of businesses or when we're doing coaching stuff, a lot of the stuff was like writing emails, building pages, and I can just outsource that stuff. Right. And my, my highest values, one of my highest values is coaching and consulting. Like I love the ideation of business, like early, like I love that, you know, but if you're good at that, sometimes you end up doing other stuff for people. Like people want help with all areas of their business. And so I could, you know, fall into the trap very often of helping people in areas that were not, you know, super fun for me. Um, and so when I say do less, it's like, yeah, I'll, I, like stay not, I don't like the term stay in your lane either. Cause I think that that's counterproductive because it's like, how, how do people learn to fly? How, like, how can you learn anything new? It's like, tell a baby to stay in his lane. It's like, that's the dumbest advice ever. I know other people say it's a good advice and context matters for staying in your lane. <laughs> context matters for all advice. So, but generally I think that, um, but my goal of this year is to, to, to be more potent. So um, I'm looking at buying and selling some businesses, but we're doing it strategically. So, you know, we have our core business in the middle. And then, so how can we acquire businesses? I just did a really cool training with, you know, Ronald Frazier, if you guys know him and some of the digital media guys, uh, how to acquire businesses that are kind of in our, in our matrix that are upstream downstream uh, from kind of our core business. And so, but I love that stuff. Like it's not, you know, the, 
people talk about motivation or inspiration, right? The entrepreneurs are always the ones that are like seeking external motivation. They're trying to like, they need the things on the walls to motivate them. They need Jocko willing to yell at them. They need to like, and if you're doing it from that force, it'll just, it won't work. You're going to burn yourself out. You want it, inspirations internal. So the things that I really like uh, doing are ideation for business, coaching, consulting, um, and then the things that I want to do less of are email writing, you know, page building. I'm still doing some of it and, you know, but I'm doing less of it. So, yeah, so my idea is to do less, but also Austin, I mean, you've talked with me this first quarter quite a bit. Uh, I'm not doing less. I mean, I, I literally, <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying all of it though. So like just, you know, from the, from the context of, you know, all the conversations I'm having, I'm, I'm staying in the zone of fulfillment more. Um, and I'm a lot more, I don't, I don't do scheduled calls. Like this is, I, I don't know. Yeah. This, this hmm. Anthony, be, no true story. This is like the only scheduled call that I've ever got him on. True story. Second thing is, is that we're working through a deal right now and he's like, I don't want to hamstring myself on what I think this is going to be. I just want to work through the process and like, let it be what it's going to be. And I, I, I think a lot of people can't do that in business because they're, you know, Anthony's really good at this too. I think they're so worried about what it's going to look like in five years, what it's going to look like in three years. And ultimately like things are going to change. Life is going to shift. And like, I think you are both very good at like, I'm just going to dive into this. And I think you're a seeker of knowledge and a seeker of opportunity, regardless of the outcome. Yeah, and well, I, no, just to summarize, we talk about systems over goals a lot. So, yeah. like, it's Scott Adams has a framework for how to how to fail at everything and almost still win, and win big. How to fail at everything and still win big. Um, he says goals are for losers, and, and when you understand what he's saying, it's like, oh, that's actually true. Like, you want a system of acquire like online. You want a system of acquiring more social assets. The more social assets that you acquire, the more your business can grow. Real estate. You want a system for acquiring more real estate. If you have a goal, you need a goal almost for orientation only, but it's not that important. You just need a system of of improving your your circumstance, and that's all. Like, it. so Anthony's licking his chops because he just said no, this. No, he no. said he said this thirty minutes ago. <laughs> I what mean, say, Leland say, and I are like bred from the same cloth here. I know like, you're the exact like, same person. Yes, yeah, I know. We, we, we might just be like, no, but I, I absolutely agree. Um, goals are for losers. Systems are for winners. They're, I'm also curious, Leland, when you're talking about doing less, it reminded me of uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations when he talks about the goal of a life well lived is to do less better. And it's like, how do we improve at those things? few things that we're uniquely suited for. And it's the 80, 20 principle. How do we get rid of that junk in our life? That's not, it's outsourceable. It doesn't, doesn't move us forward. It doesn't uplift our, our soul and make us feel fulfilled. And I like that you put that, like you're living in the zone of, uh, I think zone of fulfillment is how you put it. I think that's a really interesting way of putting that. Um, so I, the, one of the things that came to mind was, have you ever heard of a uh, Josh Waitskin? I figure yeah, if you're yeah. a chess story, you might, you might know who Josh is. I know Josh. Is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he has a line that says, the goal is unobstructed self-expression. So the goal is to, to live your being through your art, right? Steph Curry, unobstructed self-expression, expressing his being through the core of his art, right? So I, I think about that at a really high level when I think about doing less. Like, what is the core of my being? Like, how can I express that through coaching, creativity, uh, not creativity, right? Th through coaching, through Don't strategy. Don't you take my value? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I'm into like, I love strategy. I love, you know, mm -hmm. that's, but, but creativity. Um, I mean, it's my wife and I joke about that. She's that's, that's her domain. Um, but, but unobstructed self-expression. And so the goal is to express your being through your art and kind of understanding what your art is first. And that's kind of the, goes back to the Tony Robbins thing. It's like most people don't really know how to express themselves through the core of whatever they're doing. And we actually live in a really cool time now more than ever where you can actually do it because people can be into the thing that you're doing all over the world where before when you're living in that, you know, fishing village, 
they don't necessarily need your love for multifamily real estate, right? Um, they need you to have a love fishing. In case, yeah, yeah. In case a bear comes, right? Or so you need to be able to contribute. So yeah, so my goal is unobstructed self-expression. And so with coaching and stuff, I think it's really useful because that's the goal for people that I work with because anything other than that is like sort of baggage, right? It's like you need to burn it away eventually, right? But but it's also the discovery versus creating it, right? Because mm -hmm. as your Mega Man was one of my favorite video games growing up. I don't know if you guys ever Same. played Mega Man. So you defeat the guy and you acquired the skill, right? That mm -hmm. like that's the life lesson, right? It's Highlander. Yep, Highlander, right? Exactly. <laughs> but so that's you don't need a goal, you need a system. So you go out, you go, you know, I hired a coach to learn real estate. So we got our first real estate thing. And then, you know, we we thought about getting into multifamily. We figured out that I don't really like, you know, doing it that way. Right. <laughs> so, you know, don't def didn't want that skill under my uh it wasn't expressing myself, right? Multifamily, like we bought, we bought a tiny apartment. We learned it. It was cool. Um, but my goal this year, Austin, is to figure out sort of what is, uh, what is expressing myself more, right? And then how can you do it kind of with whatever modality, right? You know, whatever <laughs> coaching calls, PowerPoints, et cetera. So he's, he's the, he's the, because just so you, for context, like me and Leland are doing Airbnb stuff together, but, 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 but basically I've never met somebody in my life that is so detached from the outcome of money being the driver in my life. And meaning that Leland is his dreams make my dreams look like they're like kindergarten shit. And it's like, you get around people like that. And he's like, Oh, I want to own a blimp. And we're going to do like this ranch with like, and, and, and I, I, but hold on, but like, you're never, but you're not scared to at least go down the rabbit hole and peek in the corner and see if you like what's in the, what's in the room. And I think there's so many people that don't even peek in the room because they're living in some comfort zone that they think is going to keep them happy for the next 40 years. And I, I appreciate the curiosity of your mind as far as like when it comes to investing and stuff, because your it's your excitement is predicated on the excitement of the curiosity, not that this, this, this asset's going to give me some external emotion from a, from a, from a dollar amount, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, so the blimp idea is still a good <laughs> it's, idea. It's for another time. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> we're, we're, listen, here's the deal. I'm going to let you in on that idea. <laughs> everybody's behind it. <laughs> so if you can pull it out, like we're totally cool with it. No, but, well, uh, so just, just for context, because I think because you brought it up, it's like, um, you know, I want the Redfield Ranch in Montana, right? Which you've seen the property. It's, it's nice, right? We want it. Um, and the next one would be to have one in Colorado. And like the coolest thing in the world would be if you've ever seen these airships, right? They can stay afloat for like days, and they're, they're coming out, they're like luxury airships, like Boeing had one and they're, they're amazing. They're quiet. They're like heat helium filled and they're, uh, but the technology is getting really better. And so you could do like a five day trip from Colorado through the Rockies in an airship, right? Looking down with like basically glass on the bottom. You, I mean, depending on how scary you want it to be. So we'll but call we, it like a sky train. Yep, so it's like nice like and slow, slow moving. Yeah. What we would do is probably would we would run a like a yoga certification during the five days, and we would sell tickets for super expensive, and we would have somebody up there, and and then they would land on our property, and it would be awesome because our property would be awesome. But yeah, so I've I've tried to reach out to the airship people. They're not like <laughs> they're not very responsive. <laughs> not very responsive. I, wanna, I I want to point something out here because Leland, you 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 said uh, you're not the create you're not a creative person. The definition of creativity that I use is take two or more disparate ideas and combine them in a novel way. And that's what creativity is. It's not like drawing or writing or painting or like the or music. It's not those necessarily. It's about looking at things that aren't connected and then connecting them in new interesting ways that nobody's thought to do before. And so that that idea, everything about it strikes me as being very creative. And so unless you tell me your wife came up with that idea entirely, I'm going to say you're a little bit more creative than you gave yourself credit for. Well, I think, yeah. So 
by definition, right? If you're, um, I would say artistic would be the word that I was using. So, yep. or the, the, yep, I'm not, I, I'm not an artistic person, but yeah, creating ideas. I think Matt Ridley calls it, uh, ideas having sex is the term that, yeah. He has. <laughs> but I really like that stuff. And so some of the stuff with Airbnbs, um, is that from innovation? Like how innovation has new spoke? Um, yeah, he he's he's talked about it with Naval on his podcast. Um, okay. They did an interview that I've listened to. You know, no, but, but here's the deal: whether or not you realize it or not, because I'm in the business of putting asses in houses to 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 make your your crazy ideas make you money, so you don't uh, have to sleep on the ground outside because you don't own stuff. But you do understand one thing about the human psyche: you do understand that experiences sell. And if you can become the leader in an experience category, because you're afflicting emotion on somebody that's going to radiate where they're going to tell the story, opposed to just going out and buying the same house and just throwing asses in there, because your, your need for something different and new and artistic is actually going to make you highly successful because you want to, you want to break the mold. And, and that's why I can get behind this shit, right? Because I have the same values. I want to create that experience, that, that a memorable moment. And that's where people get lost. Like, yeah, you can model other people and you can do what they do, but you can also break the mold and create something that's never been done before. That's going to make you at the end of the day, it's going to make you a lot of money if done properly. Now, unfortunately, I'm the one that has to go out and execute all these things, which I'm totally comfortable and capable of doing, but, but, but but I wonder, right? So you don't know this about Anthony. And my girlfriend asked me this yesterday, and, and I don't know the answer. He was a professional rock climber, and uh, he used to sleep out in the stars and everything oh, like that. Anthony was. Yes. Oh, yes. my God. You got to meet my buddy, Jason. He lives in Ure in Colorado right now. He, it's oh, an nice. ice climbing capital. Ice climbing world. capital. Yeah. 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 He, he's, yeah. he actually builds ice. He builds. He's building uh, tracks today for out. Like, he's full we're running spartan in montana in big fork uh-huh. in a month if you want to come join us at our lake house <laughs> we're staying at our lake house so shoot me uh, the details we'll take a look at it uh i would love to i don't know if i'll be able to make it work on that timeline but jason's trying to finish in the top five for his group so just Beast. know that yeah, yeah he's, so he's, okay uh, okay another time another i would time. just try to be but, so so <laughs> I'm retired. So, so you went very clear. From, retired. You went, you went from professional rock climbing, which we still don't know how you get paid for that, but that's a whole other story. Uh, to buying multifamily buildings and and writing books and everything. And does any part of you search to go back to that eventually in your life, or that untethered lifestyle, or are you comfortable in that chair every day, talking on Zoom? doing business was that a time and place in your life or or will it show up again like i'm just curious that's a that's a really powerful question for me you know freedom is my highest value um like not being tethered to anything be able to go do what i want when i want where i want with who i want and that served me for a very long time with rock climbing and snowboarding and, you know, writing, like these were all things that allowed me to go do that. And now with building businesses, it's a little bit different. I still feel free because I can leave at any given point. It's as Leland uh, put it earlier about building your way out of the business or building yourself out of it. It's working, you know, on the business, not in the business. And as long as I am in that frame of reference, I'm happy with where I am. But my goal long-term is to be in a place where I'm not needed. I don't like being needed on any given day. I want to, mm-hmm. I love being able to just wake up and decide like at that moment where my passion is leading me and spend my time and energy on that thing. Because I, I believe, I firmly believe that if we, if everybody had the, the ability to wake up every day and just spend their time solving the problems that meant the most to them at that moment, that we could solve pretty much any issue known to mankind. And so my goal is to first get my life to a place where I can be in that position, where I can just wake up and say, this is the problem that is that means the most to me right now. That's what I'm going to put all my time and energy into. And then by consequence, if I can help other people do that as well with their lives and get to that same place where they're just solving the problems that mean the most to them, then I think that's how I can have the most impact. And that, and thus is the most freedom I can have. I love it. 
Well, dude, do you even want to highlight what you do or you don't even want to tell people that? Do you want to tell them how they can find out about you? I, I it's up to you, bro. With me? Yeah. I know. It's like, no. they, they probably couldn't figure it out if they looked. So. <laughs> guys, guys, he is the most interesting man in SEO and, and yoga and YouTube. Don't don't try no, to contact so, him. So that, he's, that, he's, that's he's, actually why I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, I am. Um, uh, you know, I do. So yes, I'll give them the elevator pitch is, you know, we, we run a, a YouTube channel with over a million subscribers. Uh, we teach, we grow a membership through that. We teach that business model to other people. We've worked with bowling, real estate, yoga, Pilates, like entertainment, bunch of stuff. It's all, all video based marketing. Um, yeah. And, and I love real estate and I love, uh, ideas and coaching and stuff like that. So, and I love business. So I'm, uh, you know, this is the stuff that's fun for me. So. I will promise you this, Anthony, in the next two years, me and this guy will be on a magazine somewhere for some weird ass shit that we did that people love. I, I swear to God, I know that we're coming. He's dude, you should, you should be on a text train it, with this it, guy. It's, it's unlikely that, that I will no, be on a magazine cover. No, right? I'll be on, I'll be on the magazine. Yeah. It's totally cool. <laughs> no, but, but he's got a lot of great ideas. We're super excited. And you know, he, I told him the other day and I'll say it again, just so it's documented. Like he, I'm on team Leland. And, and I think that people need to understand that the ideas are one thing. The person you're buying into is an entirely different thing. And if you believe in who you are as a person and that person that you're in business with, that goes a long way. Like it's the same thing. I would invest in Anthony in a, an apartment deal and I don't even need to see the deal. And when you can create that kind of commerce and that kind of relationship in business, because they know what you stand for, it goes a long way. And so in my opinion in business, that's what you're seeking is for people to be in business with you, not the idea that you created. I, I appreciate that. Naval calls that character luck. And that's one of the reasons why I don't like telling people that I, I built a yoga business because, you know, it's, it's not, it's not beneficial, right? Austin, Austin's not an Airbnb guy. Austin yeah. is a, uh, Austin is a man of impact. Well, I, I tell you this, and not to get all emotionally gushy here, I, you are one of the only people that sees me for me and doesn't see my labels of what I have done. And so I appreciate that. It, it means something to me because I've got to a point right now, and I haven't, I haven't 100 percent because I'm happy to share my story. But I'm so fucking sick and tired about talking about alcoholism and Airbnb. Like I don't want to talk about it anymore. It doesn't define who I am. It was a moment in time. And, and you need to understand that you can move so far away from those things that they served you, but that doesn't mean that they are who you are currently. Yeah. There's a, building a brand is a trap. A lot of times. I mean, people don't, they, it, it can be a trap. And so yes. uh, I, I feel this, this box that we're on right now, the podcast. I love it. I love adding value, but sometimes I do feel like there's an obligation. And when I feel that I don't, I don't, I need, I know it's time to step away for a minute. Yeah. And that's, that's why I took a 20 day break because I just, it just wasn't, it didn't feel genuine. And I want to make sure that I show up on this camera genuine at all times. Yeah. So bravo. Otherwise it won't work. That's the other thing. You got to be genuine, man. Online. You get that. If it's not genuine, it won't work. Perfect. Yeah. You want anything else, Hans? We out? I got nothing. All right. Thank you. I'm wiping my hands much, clean. Guys. Thank we'll you, guys. See you. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us here at The Brain Dump. Now, before you go, it's important to solidify what you've learned here today by taking action. If all you do is listen, then you're only going to retain a small amount of the information you consumed here today. So take a quick moment to really lock in any key insights, tidbits, or pieces of wisdom that you want to carry with you into the future. 
You can do this by heading over to iTunes and leaving a review with your top three takeaways from this episode. If you've already left a review, first, thank you so much. Second, it's time to start a brain dump journal. It doesn't have to be fancy, just a slip of paper will do where you can record a couple quick thoughts from each episode. Science shows this is one of the best ways to ensure long-term retention of new information. And finally, if you've got a brother, a sister, a coworker, or a best friend that you think would benefit from this episode, do them and us a favor and share with them this episode. Your support, as always, means the world to us. 